Welcome everyone to another episode of Afikra Movie Night. This is the first episode in our new series and we are excited to kick things off with the film director of 1982, Walid Mannas. Walid is a highly acclaimed uh, director and producer and writer. Today he is, um, we are talking about his highly acclaimed film, 1982, um, but we are going to be diving into his life and his work beyond that. Walid, thank you for joining us and welcome to Afikra. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's really, uh, I've been looking forward to this. So, yeah. yeah. So let's start um I, you know, usually I like to start biographically, like where did you grow up and stuff like that. But I'm going to change the question a little bit um, because 1982 feels a little biographical. I want to start by asking you um, the teenage version of Walid, who was going back and forth, you know, between Liberia and Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Would he be surprised at what you're doing professionally? Uh, that's a very good question. Actually, no. <laughs> yeah, what did he think? Uh, he he kind of always wanted to do this. Um, when he was in Africa and he was 14 years old, we're talking about when he, this, the other guy, right? So it's like, uh, we, it was very funny because he did have a conversation very clearly on the balcony with some older people about the fact that he wanted to make films. And at the time, they're like, ha ha. <laughs> I mean, I was in Liberia. He, there was like nothing of the sorts. We didn't even have cinemas. Everything was being shipped to us on beta cam from the United States. Uh, so actually not beta, beta cam, sorry, beta max. <laughs> so beta max. It's the beta max days, which are the small video videotapes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of always knew that that's what I wanted to do. So um, I just didn't think I would get to it. And yeah, and somehow the world conspired to make it happen. I mean, I almost wanted to go to med school at one point, that get, and you know, and somehow everything sort of would shift, would shift, would shift, would shift. And I just felt like it's it just happened, you know. And then I moved to the US. I didn't think I'm gonna go back and make a film in Lebanon. And then somehow also the world re oriented itself and somehow the country that re-entered my life you know it's it's weird like i i i had a feeling you know when i was young that this was was going to be the case i didn't yeah. think it would be possible and it happened so i have a theory about this and my theory is that when um when a child grows up in a situation like you did where you're you're not you're not consuming the medium in the des in the sort of designed fashion you're not yeah. going to this beautiful multiplex and watching everything right right on the silver screen you're watching it on bootleg beta tape uh beta max tapes or vhs later um somehow I, my theory is that things become small and it's almost like you like are un, undoing the remote control and you're like oh oh just a small little tape maybe i could do this i mean like yeah it, it, does that sound right to you uh yes 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 and and Hold on, the sun is rising. <laughs> We're in Los Angeles, guys. Um, does that sound right to me? Uh, yes and no. You know what I mean? Whatever is small in your mind is very big in some cases, and it's really like, yeah. So yeah. It's, yeah. So what I want to do now, just before we start jumping into the film and some of the background and how your career got you there, I want to play the trailer. Um, for those who haven't seen this. And I believe that if you're based in the Arab world, um, you can watch 1982 on Netflix. I know that I watched it last night. Um, but for those who are somewhere around the world, you can try to find it. Um, but th let's watch the trailer a little, a little bit and um, then we'll talk about it. في 
ياسمين So I want to ask you a question, um, and it's about that first slide. The first slide said the directorial debut, uh, but you've been working in movies for a long time. Did it feel like this was your directorial debut? <laughs> it's a very funny question because um, it did, and it did. It, it, it's very like it's my ninth film as a producer. Uh, but my first as a director. Uh, so it did on some level feel like a directorial debut. The difference is I wasn't scared because I had been very, I had been present on so many sets. And even as a producer, my function as a producer has really been primarily as a creative producer. So I was always on sets and, and uh, I wasn't, I didn't feel the fear of of i think you know um it felt like the first message that i wanted to put out yes and i knew what i was doing and i knew that it was necessary and i knew what i wanted to say but i kind of i did it at a point where i was ready like i've built a career and and my objective was never like I think of producers as filmmakers, I think of editors as filmmakers, DPs yeah. as filmmakers. People try to make the distinction, but at the end of the day, it takes a village, right? So, so I've never thought of myself other than a filmmaker, no matter what. Even if I was producing, uh, I usually embed myself very closely in the creation process. Yeah. Uh, so, therefore, on a personal level, I felt like yes, this is a, this is a directorial debut, but I didn't. It wasn't my first time on set and taking important decisions. Does that make sense? So I wasn't afraid. Absolutely. Of it. Yeah. Going back to your childhood um, in in Bremena. So you were at Bremena High School in 1982, and um, the, and that's the it's set in like CHS, but it's obviously Bremena High School. For anyone. <laughs> yeah. Who's ever been to Bremena? It's very obviously Bremena High School. Yeah. Um, uh, how what are your memories from that time that were not captured on film snow days <laughs> mm. uh, were you in the dorms by the way or were you were you staying uh, I, I was in Bremen high school for three years um yeah. my first year which is when i was seven years old i was in the dorms yes yeah and those were amazing and it was um and uh yeah, and I remember the snow days. And then even, I mean, I love the school in winter more than I ever loved it in the summer because I'm sort of, my nature is a winter guy. So so um, what I love, I mean, there's so many things like, you know, when you're writing such a such a narrative and you're going back to your to to your childhood, I mean, there were there was I was very obsessed with with uh, with pottery, and we had their own we had a pottery class, which is you know what I mean. So that I used to like want to go to. Uh, we used to really the school was surrounded by forests. Now there's fences. At the time when we were kids, there were no fences. Like we would actually just go into the forest during break and and just come back during class. So all of these things like. But at the same time, those were part of the normal the, the normal life of that school, which for me, like I can still feel it, I can still smell it, I can still, you know. And in the film, I kind of try to 
take us back to that moment in time, to the sound, the sonic nature of Brumana, as you probably know, with all the cicadas that, that come out every year. And yeah. they're not like cyclical cicadas like in other places. They're actually annual. <laughs> so I mean, some places like the cicadas just come out like four or five years later in cycles. In Brumana, with... so those were things Don't that... Want, I, I, it doesn't even feel annual. It feels nightly. <laughs> Night, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> we can talk about when I was when I went to shoot and I, I decided I wanted to sleep in Brumana, yeah. and and I couldn't sleep because of the cicadas. And yeah. I'm like, okay. yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, there are a lot of corners of that school for me that just kind of stayed with me forever, and and I remember them, and and uh, and uh, I tried to capture as much of them as possible in that single day but also situating the whole film during the course of that one day on an exam day also has a particular feeling to it, which I tried to really dig deep into my memory for. Yeah. Um, so the, the film takes place on a single day, right? Um, yeah. And there are, that's almost like a mini genre films that, that take place in a single place in a single day, you know, the, 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 the do right, do the right thing, uh, yeah. the do the right thing model. Right. Yeah. Um, and I know that 1982 first started as a short story. Um, was it always important to you that this was an exact moment? It was, it felt like a small universe peering out at a big reality that these, these people don't have any control over. Was that always the idea? That was always the idea. It was very funny because whenever, you know, when, like when I was writing that short story, I could never finish that short story because somehow it got emotional. And I didn't think I was writing any small big story per se. You know, I was just kind of narrating this thing. And um, and it somehow, I didn't even think it was going to become a film or anything like that. That, that. that was not even in my mind. I didn't think even there was a film there. Uh, and uh, no, I mean, the story sort of grew, you know, but I think let's say let's say I wrote this I wrote this short story like I was in my twenties, right? And let's say I decided to make it into a film in my twenties. I think it would have been a different film from the film that I did when I when I made nineteen eighty two. Because I think having the, had the experience and having seen basically for me somehow the smallest stories are the biggest stories, you know. Because in the smallest stories, you actually get to really sink into the people. And when you realize how universal human emotions are, then the story gets even bigger. And this is really where we went, where I went with 1982. I didn't know this when I was younger. And when I was writing a story, I was writing a story. This is what happened. A plus B equals C. And, and at the end of the day, you realize that A plus B equals C actually has a philosophical and existential dimension that you didn't expect or even see uh, earlier. And then, as it became, as it as as we were making it, even in the edit, the film even started revealing itself even more, more than it was on the page, which was what was really beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it's. Um... I'm curious about the the editing process, and so I guess let's let's go through some of the the basic questions. When did you actually shoot this? Twenty seventeen. Yeah, yeah. So you shot it in twenty seventeen. This is pre Thaura. Pre Thaura. Twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen. Actually, we shot the everything with the kids was shot in twenty seventeen. A lot of the other stuff because we were limited in time. Uh, I couldn't shoot a lot of the other school stuff. So uh, we had to shoot this during the summer. So if I didn't shoot 2017, I had to wait to 2018 summer. So we ended up shooting in 2017, shooting the bulk of it, and then went through the editing process. There were certain shots that we simply didn't have time to get during the, sh during the shoot. And I knew I wanted them for the edit. And I went back about a, like maybe eight months later in 2018 and captured those and recaptured some things that are pretty much most of the tonal stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. What was the editing process like in general? I mean, are you a super involved? I'm super involved in the edit. I, I, it's very funny. Like I had an unexpected editing journey, but I also realized that it was, and I think I would repeat that same sort of formula. Um, uh, we, 
shot and I worked with an editor, Sabine Jmail, in, in LA to just form the whole, the, 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 the bigger picture. And I realized that the material that we were dealing with was actually very delicate and very difficult. And I'm a very tedious, I'm very tedious in the in the in the editing process because I I shoot with an edit in mind. So I kind of know, like, I don't cover, just cover this and this. Like, I know where I want to be at what moment, even before, as I capture the scene. So um, so we did that and we built it and we built the, the first cut. And then I like to take space from the material and go back and re-examine the material. So we did a first section of the edit was with Sabine for about uh, 14 weeks, which was the assembly and a very rough cut. And then from there, I stepped back and I'm like, okay, I, I, st I actually do need this and this and this and this. And those were the shots that I was not able to capture the first time around. Uh, and then I came back to Beirut and I went back and I, um, and, uh, and just as I watched it, I'm like, I need to check because there were certain things that I thought I had that were, did not make it into the rough cut. And then, and then so I had to reopen the edit in Beirut and I reopened it with Jad Dani Ali Hassan, who edited my short film, with whom I have an incredibly beautiful also uh, relationship creatively, because he's one of he's one of the most evolved, I think, people in terms of how perce he perceives films and he understands them genre wise, everything wise. And he's always honest to the material. And he and I started working. And then what we did is I, I brought him in for the second part, which is the fine cutting of the film, which is essentially the crochet work. We have the structure and now we get into the crochet. The crochet work for me is a very, it's very delicate. Uh, uh, I am, can I use, can I use bad language? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a major frame fucker. <laughs> so, so like, so, so I literally like Jad and I would be like, okay, no, I'm like, okay, this needs to lose two frames. This needs to be like, it was that kind well, of. I mean, I have this theory about people who worked in um, music videos and when they start making shorts and features, it, it, they're immaculate. It's almost like you're used to working in miniatures. Like this shot for me, there's mo so many of these moments where they're, they're it just so beautifully framed and the pacing is gorgeous and the color is amazing. Everything's amazing about it. And I'm like, for me, it's, it's almost like you're so used to like living in three minutes that you're like, I get 200 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, yes, yes, and no. It's it's really, but material does command itself in a way, you know, uh, and you have to trust it. I mean, yeah, there is I mean, there is an aspect of the film that's music video. And we'll talk about that. So, so that's definitely, you know, at the end of the day, nothing does. Everything informs everything. Everything has been informed by my previous work, you know. So sure. you're like every piece of work you do is the result of everything you've done before it, no matter what. You can't say that that's not, nobody can actually say that that's not because, um, yeah. So with the editing process, yes. Uh, but also it helps to have like someone like Jad, who was actually very, pra he, he really pragmatized the edit for me in a beautiful way. And there was an, like, sometimes we completely disagree on things and we would know that he, he's not a hundred percent and I'm not a hundred percent. And we actually, we would work to try to find what works for him and for me. And I think that was amazing. And what we did is we, we do, we edit for three weeks, we stop for two months, and then we go back and edit for three weeks, and then we stop for two months. So every time we re examine the material, we really did manage to, to arrive at, at the finest, at the finest, uh, the finest possible edit from the material we have. And this is what I love. I love the editing process. But what's important for me is that I do not believe that a film should be edited in one fell swoop. I think you do your cut, you step away, you come back, you do another revision, step away. It's like writing, you know, you need, you need that distance in a way. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, before, before I move on, this is maybe sounds like a silly question, but do you like the movie or are you a fan of your own work? Like when you watch it now, do you cringe? No. I don't, um, I don't, 
at all, actually, which is kind of surprising. Like I've cringed at some of my other work. I think with this one, it's I'm pretty. It's pretty like, yeah, no. I mean, I. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I I don't have that. Uh, I feel very lucky to do that because like. What was interesting in this film is I also am a producer, so I had a lot of control, right? And and I think that really liberated the film and liberated me in that I had to judge myself harshly. I went to people who judged my the work harshly as well. And I would say the film is about 80% of what I originally wanted it to be, which is, you know, and then whatever was cringeworthy, I mean, if it wasn't, if I was holding on to it, Judd would be like, Walid, no, <laughs> so let's take this out. Yeah. So that was really, that was really, uh, that was really incredible, you know? And uh, no, I'm, I'm very proud of the film. Um, there's a few moments where I think, oh, I wish I did this. I wish I did that. But they're not like, they're not something that anybody would tap into. You know, you know a name like 1982 as a title is, and it's very much like a Lebanese, if you know, you know. Yeah. Like there isn't a, a Lebanese person over the age of, I don't know, 25 or 28 who wouldn't immediately know about the moment you're talking about. Yeah. You know, it's definitely not about like some football team that, you know, goes to the World Cup in 1982. Like it, immediately, I understand what you're talking about. I know what this kid is looking up at. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't think anyone else does. Um, and I wonder if, if, you know, like that was a part of the idea. I, we are, I am speaking to Lebanese, Lebanese audience who needs to talk through this. I mean, one of the reasons I made this film, it's, it's basically to create this discussion because as you know, in Lebanon, we, our history books don't address any of the war. Nobody wants to talk about it. Our parents didn't talk to us about it uh, because it's it's hush-hush, right? Because you're not supposed to talk about the bad things and the polemic things. And, um, and I just felt like I wanted to do this and I wanted to do this delicately in a way that someone understands it and experiences it. So the film really grounds itself in a naturalism that is unusual. And that's pretty, I mean, I'm asking the audience to kind of stay with me here, live this moment with me, experience this moment with me. And it's fascinating how universal it is because what's people who were like, like people who watch the film sometimes tie this film into other battles that they've experienced and they see the similarities of it. Like for people in the US, for example, when they see this film, those who are in New York immediately takes them back to 9-11. In Lebanon, it takes them back to 2006, you know? And for some people, yeah. it's like, I mean, the, the hardest part is what happened in 2020 because that was really a complete reminder that we are still exactly where we were. 50 years ago, 40 years ago. So so I think the film sort of transcends time in that regard. And I wanted it to create curiosity. Um, like, and I know that this curiosity happened with my nieces and nephews because they watched the film. They went home and it's like the conversations with my, with, with the parents. It's like, what happened? Like, why is, because it's not in our history books. And, and, and unfortunately, yeah. it's policy that it's not in our history books. You know what I mean? Because the suppression of history is actually because everybody's fighting about which history they want to write, and which side of the story they want to write. And I'm like, okay, let me step outside of the fight about who's going to write this history. Let me write it from my experience as a human being in Lebanon. And I don't care whose side I'm on. And this for me was very important because... Because this, when you do that, you kind of liberate yourself from the polemics and you liberate yourself from the biases. And kids, as kids, we didn't have biases. We didn't care. You know, <laughs> like biases are sort of like contamination, contaminations that that kind of start, we start to acquire from the world around us, from the, you know, from these conversations. And I wanted, with 1982, I really, it was very important for me to present a moment in time that will make people ask questions, that will make people go revisit that moment, that will make people like talk to their parents about, you know, and it's doing that. It's doing that not only in Lebanon, it's doing that in most of the expat communities around the US where, and Canada where the film is playing, like I get messages from people uh, from parents, they're like, 
they're like, thank you for this film because it's we took our kids and and the conversations we we stayed up all night talking. For me, this is this is why we make these films, you know, so that we remember and and not let it happen again. And unfortunately, I mean, I know not many people, unless you have Netflix, you, nobody can see this. Not many people can see this film in Lebanon, which is to me a bit heartbreaking. Uh, I love that it's on Netflix, but the theatrical experience of this film that's being experienced everywhere in the world has never been seen and experienced in Lebanon. Um, so um, it's just like, this is, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about the past because right now we're exactly where we were 40 years ago because we refuse to talk about it. You know, that's. Yeah. I mean, last night we watched it and, and I, I, I want to talk to you about the sound uh, because um, we were talking about the, the sound of the mina, but also the sound of the bombs and the sounds of the sonic booms and the sounds of the plane were so realistic and the, the the word isn't realistic. Let me actually be a little more precise. The sounds were so probable. Yeah. That last night we looked out the window at one of the scenes. Yeah, and it, we jumped at one of the scenes because the reality that you're portraying is so absurdly probable. Yeah. In today's Beirut and today's Lebanon, that it's heartbreaking and like real acting. <laughs> it's awful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's uh, for the sound, sound. I mean, as you know, you saw the film yesterday, sound in the, the film doesn't have an antagonist. The antagonist in the film is the sound, you know, and the sound was written even at the script stage. And I worked with a phenomenal, I don't know if you know, you probably do, Rana Eid in Beirut, who is, in my humble opinion, <laughs> one of the best sound designers in the world. Uh and and I will work with her on every film I will make, hopefully. Uh, and uh, when we worked together, I sent her the script. She loved it. And, and, and it was about the convergence of how she experienced it and how I experienced it. Because I was in East Beirut. She was in West Beirut, where the Butte of the Bat were, which is, which is not very far from the the the, the, the Sabra and Shatila. So, so the thing is, like, all of this, if you watch the film a second time and you listen to the news, uh, the news narrative, you listen because all yeah. this exists. It, it exists in the news narrative and which was developed separately, by the way, with Sahar Mandur, who's an incredible researcher uh, and novelist in Lebanon. Uh, but anyway, so the sound was very particular. And I wanted to bring my experience of that sonic, my sonic experience of that day and Rana's sonic experience of that day. And that's why the sound sort of also the sound universalizes the film for people who are on both sides of the divide. You know, it was even more extreme for Rana than it was for me. For us, it was in and out. For them, it was a constant in West Beirut because they were under the bombs. So this, yeah. I wanted that feeling of being under the bombs without being under the bombs to come across. So... Um, you know, it's unbelievably effective. Um, the other thing, the other like constant thread is that you're very, 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 um, effective at making the audience aware of the sky Oh yeah, from the beginning, the pigeons, um, the enormous, the enormity of the sky, right? But Amana has these really big skies cause it's right at the beginning of the mountain where you overlook, yep. um, yep. overlook Beirut. Um, was that written in from the very beginning as this mm -hmm. is, you know, yep. the, the question, since when do we have pigeons in, in school? Is that yep. something that you remember thinking to yourself in 1982 or? No, that's, that's the vice actually that, that was, that, that came about. I, I kind of have a thing with animals. Um, I don't really particularly recall pigeons. I recall more, uh, I recall the fish in the fish tank <laughs> this at the beginning like that. I recall, I recall birds. I don't recall them in the same narrative that I put in the, in the film. I mean, that's for me was more of a narrative device. And it goes back to sort of my classic and Shakespearean sense because it's sort of the harbinger, sort of like the three witches, like yeah. like the witches. You know what I mean? Like like everybody. Since when there are pigeons in the school, it immediately telegraphed. This is a day unlike any other. So it's like on a literary level, there's that that thing that plays throughout the film. You know, it's almost like there's almost this. It it sort of previews the surrealism that's 
go to show up at the end yeah. where the yeah. kid's like, you're not even sure if he's imagining the, the pigeons by the end of it. I mean, he's seeing them. That's but, interesting. Okay. Uh, uh, I forget the other kid. Majid doesn't say, Majid says, I, I don't know. He doesn't say, ah, eh. <laughs> lick, lick, mm. lick. He doesn't, he doesn't actually acknowledge it. He says, yeah. ah, no, I haven't noticed it. Yeah. 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 So it's, uh, yeah. I mean, that the, the, the pigeon narrative is a particular, it, it has dimensions. Like there is a metaphor there that what's interesting is I didn't really realize what that was until after I finished writing and after I finished the film, and the yeah. even funnier part is when I was doing this, the uh, when I was doing this, uh, when we were about to shoot, because the pigeons are written, you know, in a script, you're like, oh, there's birds, oh, there's birds, oh, there's birds. And I remember having a chat, <laughs> telling telling the the production team, I'm like, okay, we need the pigeons, and they thought they thought the pigeons were just like a flurry. Like, like that they were just there as an accent in the writing. And I'm like, no, 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 I need pigeons. I need those birds at the school. <laughs> and it was very funny because suddenly it was like one day of shooting with the birds and suddenly it's like multiple days shooting with the birds and suddenly it's bringing the birds back because of continuity. And so it was very, it was a very funny thing because, because you realize that in world building, which the film does, I'm building that world, that school, and that school is complete in and of itself. Every detail counts you know um so okay speaking of uh a speaking of devices i want to talk about grandizer um who is a very (laughs) important fixture in in the film our culture in our culture and that's what i want to talk to you about um when you were a kid how much did these types of comic books mean to you and why was it so important to include this this idea this figure and a imagined version of him in the in the film it was very interesting like i i kind of when i started like i knew that this is where i wanted the film to end like the beginning and the ending for me i i have to know my beginning and my ending once i know my beginning and ending everything kind of comes because everything sort of have to, has to serve what you're trying to do and when i was a kid grandizer yes i was kind of obsessed with grandizer we used to watch it every week and talk about it the following day and then i also was obsessed with robots i was never really a good i drew but i was never really good at drawing and i didn't really pursue developing that but i would draw a lot of these these triangular and rectangular shapes and try to make like uh um you know my own robot and uh and uh i don't know it was really important and also in that, of course, it's it's he signed. I mean, we saw him signs his love notes with a figure with that with those with that with that figure, and yeah. it's sort of it's sort of the anonymity also that I used when I was a kid when I wrote love letters. <laughs> so even though I got discovered and I got to some major trouble, but you know, so uh, uh, Grandizer stays with us, you know, even as as we grew up, and you only kind of understand him even more as you grow up. I. And he's a hero, right? I mean, there it is, Batal Shab. I mean, in our minds, we always wished for that. <laughs> you know, you want this. You want yeah, especially something. in a society with no heroes. Exactly, exactly. You 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 wish for that. You want this. I mean, there's an there's an aspect of it. I mean, he is like the savior, the, the awaited one, whatever. Like in the film, there's so many layers to what happens and why this works at the end, because it's really it's really the emotional honesty of our desire is that's where the, the film ends with the dream desire, the emotional honesty, the if only, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, as somebody who never went to film school, um, I'm curious, uh, who are you sort of referencing with the, the final scene? Not to give it away, but are there are there films in your mind you're sort of throwing back to? Um, really, who am I referencing? Not particularly referencing as much as like, uh, the first thought that I wanted was less anime and more along the lines of The Wall. Hmm. Where things sort of tra- where it's kind of the transformative animation begins as something and becomes something else. Yeah. Um, and then 
And then really, I just wanted to, and then I realized I'm like, no, 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 I need to be just pure to the simple anime, uh, 18 frames, 14 frames per second. We did studies on that. And I wanted that movement to feel the same. Yeah. Uh, I just like, it was not, it was literally referencing Grandizer itself. Yeah. You know, and Grandizer itself from my memory texturally. Exactly. You know? Not like a contemporary clean version of it. So this was very important. Like even the color scheme that you're actually putting on this notebook that we're looking at, it's that sort of like those colors. I mean, even when I was working with, um, when I was working with the color schemes in the film, uh, it was really important that, okay, at the time, in, in the in the early 80s and the 70s, Pantones did not exist the way we have them today. And we did not have yeah. a million colors, so they were very defined. So so that was something also that was necessary to go back to, you know? Yeah, the, 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 color, the color elements of the entire film are so meticulous. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's really beautifully done. I um, mean, between... The color was a particular, like a lot of like people, like the, the unsung person on this. I mean, it's very funny because like uh, I worked with Bilal Hibri, who you might have heard of um, yeah. from Lucid in Beirut. And literally we worked on the color for a long, long time, for about a year, because I knew I wanted a color narrative that's very particular. We couldn't achieve that color. I mean, outside of what the production design did and what the wardrobe team did in terms of getting everything, I think, perfect. And I gave them complete autonomy and liberty. Uh, it was the most beautiful approval process because everybody who came to this film, everybody who worked on this film brought their soul to it and yeah. brought the desire to really achieve a truth in it. And this was so wonderful to see in my production designer, in my, in my, wardrobe, in my wardrobe team as well. And then, and then when it came down to, uh, I knew that the film needed to start in a particular palette and in a particular palette. We meticulously, Bilal and I worked all, like shot for shot. It's not like we said a look, it's like shot for shot, how the film sort of progresses from the blue to the red and how we maintain this color and how we maintain this pastel feel overall. Uh, because in our memory also, that world was not contrasty, you know? Yeah, and, and and it was very important for me that the film feel like that, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's very very effective. Um, I want to ask you the the idea of I, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Munia uh, I, uh, <laughs> what it was like being a director um, working with a really acclaimed director as one of the stars um, and what that process was like. Nadine was so wonderful and generous. Um, the first, um, you know, I sent, I shared with her that script at what in 2013 <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And she loved it. And she's like, yes, I'll do it, but let's see what happens. You know, cause she was doing her thing. I was doing my thing. I know I didn't have the money at the time. So we were raising money for the film. And then when it came back around in 20, 2017, I'm like, Nadine, like, I think we're, we might be shooting the film this year. She's like, okay, let me have another read of it and whatnot. And she was in the middle of Kafarnaum and just editing. And she'd been editing for, for months and months and months. And then she's like, just let me know your dates when you know them. And I let Nadine know my dates. And, and, and it turned out that our shoot dates fell exactly on her vacation. She's like happy vacation. Huh? Yeah. Happy she's vacation. Like, she's like, I she's like, okay, this is like okay, but she's like, but I can't like I can't give you my whole vacation. I can give you like maybe 12 days, like 14. Like we went back and forth on that. But she like, and then she came and I remember having her first reading, and she comes to the office because and and we sat there and we were going through the lines and going through the scenes and all of that. And she's like, I just want you to know I am completely like an actor here. And I want you to feel free to tell me anything. What was really amazing about this is she was really very liberating. Um, she's really such a pro and such a professional that uh, it was amazing. And what made it even better on set is I knew there was a lot going on with her because she was like, like the, the, they they were even though she was on vacation 
I don't think Nadine is the type of person that does take a full on vacation. <laughs> like I think her editors were still working and things were going on. So I could know I, I could kind of sense the distress. But what was interesting is also she she had just had my room, her, her youngest kid, and and it was very funny because she brought so much mater, so much of her maternal self to this role, which is exactly what I wanted out of this role. And and uh when we did the scenes or when we do stuff, um, if there was a change that we needed to do, this is where it's really fantastic because she's also a director. She understands the nuance of what you ask for as a director. I'm like, okay, there's this and there's that. And literally, like, we go for a second take and the shift is exactly where she, she like, the level of understanding was so wonderful in terms of nuance, in terms of representing representing that. So it was very liberating. And she was so incredibly generous as an actor. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really, really beautiful performance. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I'm very proud of said, um, You know, understated and really delicate. Um, but the majority of the cast are our young people. Um yeah. And as a as a former former school teacher, I um, thought <laughs> took me you back. Were a school thinking. teacher? Yeah, I was a high school teacher. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so it took me days uh, back to my days in the classroom. And so I'm curious what it was like working with this pretty uh, large cast of young people who um, don't remember this moment. That's that's a question that has a very long answer, but I'll try to be. Okay, go for it. <laughs> uh, it was amazing. First of all, uh, you can never underestimate the intelligence of kids, and they're more intelligent than we are. They're more intuitive than we are, and they get it. And what was really important is that I become their friend, not their director. And a lot of the material and a lot of their performances were actually driven by how they did things rather than by how I wanted them to do things. I even changed some scenes around in order to that to to have them uh, because they said, "Well, if we wouldn't do this like this, we'd do this, we'd do X, Y, Z." For example, like the kids running to the fence at the with the tanks. I mean, in the script and in my plan was that they they all just freeze in the soccer field and. And uh, we finished shooting and we rotated the tanks. We saw Muhammad um, Dali comes back to me and he's like, Walid, like, really, we wouldn't do this. Like, if we had tanks passing, we would run to the street. We would run to the tanks. We would, you know, and I'm like, I looked at Abla, I'm like, okay, Abla, this is, and then, sure. And it was one of the most beautiful, effective moments when you see these kids just kind of run towards the fence. Yeah. And see, like, this was, this was not me. This was me giving the kids, uh, the empower, empowering the kids to not be afraid of coming and telling you what they think, what their truth is. And this was very important to achieve their truths. And yeah. then I had them talk to their parents about this, the, the, the situation, but at the same time, I had to sort of bring a relatability for them to, to, so they are able to relate to the material so they can deliver the performances. Right. So, yeah, sure. uh, it depends on how, like each person approached it very differently. Um, and I knew as a director what I could take and how I could project the emotion. Uh, in the meantime, if they had an emotional scene, I would literally have a conversation with them and try to see what in their minds was. Like, for example, like I did take them to a moment in time where like, was there a moment in time where you felt um where 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 you, where you were afraid your parents won't show, for example, simple as that. What do you think of that? You know, I would take them to these moments where they would kind of describe them to me, and then and then this was early in the process, and I never revisited them. Those were in conversations that happened. It's not like like at that point bring it back. Um, I went through a very rigorous process with them, but not a heavy, not a process where they were working per se. So, so. We saw Abla and Christine Joaquin, who was the, who were the primarily leading the casting, uh, 
we saw like about 700 students between different, different schools, different classes, different everything from that. We came down to about 150 who we brought in for casting. From that, we went down to 30. Those 30, we took them to sort of a six-week workshop. It's not like workshop, come and do lines and all of that. No, it was hanging out, trust exercises, watching movies together. That was key. Watching movies together and having, and not me telling them what to like and not like about the movie, but having them tell me what they liked and didn't like about these films and what they thought of the acting, of the performances of the kids in these films. So I empowered them to kind of be able to judge other performances to see what worked for them and what didn't work for them. And we use that as a reference point. And then about three weeks into this, after three weeks into this is when I assigned the roles. Once I assigned the roles, then we started working deeply. A lot of the scenes were rewritten um, to what they would do or what they would say. Cool. And, and then during those times, I mean, we had dinners together, hung out and watching movies together. So clearly they formed cliques. They fell in love with each other. You knew who was going to, whoever would did not end up with a speaking role as a part of the classroom. So it's like, so it kind of formed the world. So by the time we arrived at shooting, they kind of were familiar. Even when we were doing the fittings uh, the week before, because the last week we didn't do any rehearsals. Uh, is when they got to the school to do the fittings, it's like, okay, this is your classroom, this is your locker. So whatever, whether we're shooting in the class or not, they knew that that was their own space and their own locker. So, and it was, so so it creates sort of a habitual thing for them. Um, yeah, I mean, and then, yeah. and then, you know, I mean, Majid really went to town improvising with Nadine. I mean, the scene he confronts her in the class when she's losing it, when the ships and all of that, those were completely his improv, not me. So Nadine was like, well, <laughs> we just kept going. And those scenes, I had two cameras. So so I think when you empower kids, they empower you back. And uh, and they had to become my friends. I had to know about their heartbreaks, but I had to give up some of mine as well to tell them things that happened to me. So I can, so, you know, it was a two-way street. Very cool. Okay, we don't have that much time. So speaking of films that you like for the movie uh, night series, we like to ask our guests to send us some of their films of note. So we'll go through this as quickly as possible. The first one is give us some films that most influenced your film. And so if you'd let us for the people who can't see the screen, tell us what these two films are. Um, uh, Where's my friend's house is really uh, it's very, very interesting it's actually, I saw this film in Lebanon when I was at university. I saw it at what used to be on Pierre Sofiel. Uh, it's Abbas Kiristami. It's literally the, the smallest, most beautiful story about a kid who wants to, who, a kid who ends up with the wrong notebook and he's going to find his friend to give him that notebook. And it was a very intimate film about, about, about this, this kid trying to find his friend's house so he can give him the notebook so his friend doesn't get in trouble the following day in school. So, it was like, somehow it stayed with me, that film, even linguistically, it, the semiotics in this film are so, so powerful. José Interdit is sort of a World War II drama that is just like absolutely beautiful. And the emotion between the kids is interesting. I mean, it's a little clunky, but there was something so truthful about it. And and somehow those are, I didn't revisit these films as I was as I was shooting 1982, or I was writing 1982, they're just like films that have left an impression on me. Cool. Because it's yeah. So, um, oops, uh, the film that you really loved as a kid. Yeah, Close Encounters. I went and I saw it at Casino de Liban with my uncle <laughs> at the movie theater there, and it just stayed with me. And it's. It's just it was just fascinating. As a kid, it didn't make much more much sense to me other than it was like wow, you know. And I love aliens. It doesn't yeah, Spielberg well, as long as they're nice. <laughs> Spielberg is great with kids. Yes, he is. Yeah. Um, the film that is so underrated. Yeah, uh, Baghdad Cafe, which not many people know. That movie is one of the reasons I make films. And my dad thought it was the most boring films and I watched it one. Uh, so I, I was a teenager. And I was just watching it over and over and over. And Gataka, uh, I just love that film. It's just like aesthetic. Yes, people of the time like it, but they tend to forget it. And it's uh, such a beautiful futuristic drama that just, it's a reference for me. So. I have to say, I've never heard of Baghdad Cafe, so I'm going to check it out. 
Oh yeah, it's a very strange and very beautiful film. Cool. Um, the film that all film students must watch. Teorema. Yeah, I couldn't talk for three days after watching this film. Uh, and then I went back into like Pasolini land. I mean, it's interesting because like nobody like, like uh, this is sort of a different world than the world that I present in 1982. And one of the things that's really important for me, and that's, I think every story sort of commands its aesthetic, right? So, so 1982, if you see the rifle, the jackal, the wolf and the boy, it's a very different aesthetic than 1982, though editorially it feels the same and whatnot, but visually and aesthetically it's very different this is one of these films that just has its own aesthetic it's so effective and it's it's really devastating like it was a devastating film for me and i just kind of just remember so much of this imagery and and then pasolini is like brutally honest about humanity okay this is on my this is on my watch list next week yeah. um the film that always makes you laugh this <laughs> Clearly, I mean, I used to recite. I still, I think, when I watch this film, like, I just, I just can't. Yeah, I you just... know, it's Office Space, and um, I was listening to a podcast recently where they were talking about um, Idiocracy, which was also made by um, the same by Mike yeah. Judge. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Office Space is just this brilliant, brilliant. It's just, film. it's just brilliant. It's. It's stupid and brilliant and smart and everything in between. And it's all, all about, it like flips the cliche on itself and it works. And it's yeah. a hugely underrated uh, Jennifer Aniston performance. Yeah, it is actually pretty underrated Jennifer Aniston performance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the flair. The flair. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want more flair? <laughs> Exotica. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Two more, two last ones before we log off. So the film that you could rewatch all the time. Exotica. I love this film. It's Atomi Goyan, Armenian Canadian filmmaker. Uh, very dark, very beautiful film. Uh, the editing structure of the scenes in this film is just brilliant. I actually always go back to that. Just that is referential for me in the editing and the timing. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, the film ha that has your favorite script. Those two. Ugh. Like I just those two okay so eternal uh, uh, sunshine of a spotless mind and a separation yes yeah eternal sunshine expresses the thing that nobody no other film has been able to express about relationships which is the desire to be and not be with someone in a beautiful it's just like such a brilliant it's it's where uh, uh, yeah and a separation is just devastating um and it's kind of generational for me with a separation when somehow the kids have to make the decision, you know, and how just is that or how unjust is it? Uh, both films really marked me. So. Okay. And we actually have two more. Okay. So the film that is most beautifully shot. Uh, between those two. Yeah. The, the Mood for Love, Wong Kar Wai, which I've seen several times. And then 2046, I just think Wong Kar Wai's visual structure, he made Hong Kong look so beautiful and sultry. And the piano, I remember seeing it at a, at a movie theater at the Présidence, La Présidence, I think it was in Zouk. Yeah. And when it first came out, and I was just like stunned by, and it was actually, for me, the piano was one of the most decisive colored, um, was one of the most effectively colored films I've ever seen. I remember the impression, I remember how important tone was. And this was one of the most tonally powerful film I've ever seen. Okay, and the last one, the film that most changed the way you think. Orlando, it liberated me on every level. <laughs> Sally Potter. It's an adaptation of the Virginia Woolf novel. Uh, I have not read the novel. I read the novel after having seen the film, and I think the novel and the film are both so different and so, so exact to each other. Um, I just think, and this is, of course, when I when I... Uh, saw Tilda Swinton for the first time. As a matter of fact, when I met Tilda Swinton, I told her about, <laughs> we had a chat about Orlando uh, and about how effective that film was and how impactful it was for me in my life. So amazing. Yeah. Uh, Walid, we're just a minute before we wrap up. So thank you so much for doing this. This has been so, so, so much fun. Thank you so much. 
Um, to anyone who is looking to watch the film, uh, look for it online. There are screenings happening all over North America, I believe, yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah. We're in cinemas uh, everywhere. We're coming back to New York. Uh, 1982, the film.com has all the listings. It's, there's a lot going on in North America right now. So, and then cool. Netflix in the Middle East, Europe, I'm not sure where, but they can look it up. Okay, so look it up. It's easy to find online, and then you can uh, find your local listing, the nearest local listing. And uh, this will go up on our podcast tomorrow and up on YouTube and social media. So please share with friends who may have missed today's talk. Walid, thanks so much. This was really, really fun. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you so much. Thank you.